Welcome once again to Wednesday New Day Bible Class at the uh, Community Baptist Church in Santa Rosa, California, where our pastor uh, is uh, pastor uh, our pastor's uh, Reverend Dr. H. Lee Turner. My name is Brother Jim Kennedy, and Sister Maria Dreyer is the one who types these lessons, so you can follow along uh, with his lessons, and we can have them to go over. Um, we got a good lesson. This is the last lesson, section six, uh, stay prepared and ready. And uh, uh, scripture will be coming from Matthew 25, 1 through 13. So uh, we want to lift up these uh, uh, prayer requests. Uh, I want to pray for uh, the sick and shut in, uh, Frederick Brady, uh, Tania Rucker. Mar Margaret Michaels, uh, Evelyn Cunningham, Sharon Berry, and Pastor Tim Swanson, uh, Swanson, uh, Michael Peterson Jr., Joseph Hampton, Canon Virginia Sanders, Elias Small, Leslie Dean Johnson, Anita Jones, Reverend Jerry Burgess, and Georgia Payton, Roderick Walker, Bonnie Harris. Sharon Rockstead, Marion Nelson, Beverly Combs, Salisa Rucker, Barnum Duncan, and Eloise Oliver. We also want to pray for all those dealing with mental health issues, homeless, and addictions. We pray for Brother Nick at Summerfield Rest Home. We pray for uh, Brother Francis uh, Fernandez, uh, Fernandez, for healing from late surgery, Sister Lorraine Chavez and family for salvation, protection, and blessing, Brother Larry Henry Sr. for physical healing and comfort, uh, Sister Ginger Wade for continued physical healing. Uh, and I want to thank you for your prayers. Uh, my surgery went uh, uh, great. Uh, I just have to. Uh, not bend and uh, lift anything for two weeks. Um, so I pray um, for my um, healing of my eye surgery. So keep me in your prayers so that I don't bend and lift anything because it's kind of um, a habit sometimes you forget about it. And I pray for Reverend uh, Michael Francis for continuing strength and healing. I pray for our, our staff, uh, uh, Sister Marie Dreyer and myself. I uh, pray for ministries, uh, Reverend Parker and Reverend Francis. Pray for the auxiliaries, ministries, teachers, and church family. And I pray for our pastor, Reverend Dr. H. Lee Turner, for encouragement, guidance, and blessings. And I uh, pray for all those out there watching and going to watch that uh, your prayers will be answered, that, uh, uh, that, you, that you do the will of the Lord. And um, so I'm going to read a scripture. I'm going to read uh, uh, from uh, Galatians 5, uh, fifth chapter, starting at the 16th verse. I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation. It says, "But if you all, uh, let me see. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves." The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us a desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the spirit, you are not under the obligations of the law of Moses. When you know or when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immortality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, hostility quarreling, jealousy, outburst, anger, selfish ambition, dissension and division, heavy drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Uh, let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There is no law against 
these things. Amen. So let's bow in a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you today, Lord, thanking you once again for being our God, Lord. We come and ask that the Spirit would just minister to our hearts today as we study your lessons on being prepared and ready for your coming, Lord. We, uh, Lord, we just uh, thank you for these lessons, Lord. Uh, we pray that it would touch people out there that watch and Lord, that they will just gain uh, 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 things that you want them to know, Lord. And we pray that uh, you just touch your hearts in a special way today, Lord, as this lesson is, uh, uh, as we read this lesson and uh, go through it, Lord. We pray that your will be done in our lives, Lord. We want to give you the praise, honor, and glory always. And we pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, like I said, it's the uh, last session of this uh, lessons here. Uh, stay prepared and ready. And it says, cash only, thank you. And the question is, when have you been caught unprepared? The point is, uh, grow in Christ as you wait for his return. The passage is Matthew 25, 1 through 13. The Bible meets life. When I was a teenager, I worked at a fast food restaurant in a mall. The owner often left teenagers alone to run the store at night. The main thing he asked was for someone to always be near the cash register, with, uh, which I faithfully did. After, after all, we knew the boss could stop by any time unannounced. One slow night, I was uh, working with two other teenagers who were in the back laughing uh, hilariously. They called out uh, for me to join them, but I persistently kept telling them no. And they persistently kept calling to me. Finally, I asleep, uh, sheepishly left my post at the register and went back. Literally seconds later, the boss came in. I quickly darted back to the front, but it was clear the boss was not happy. I was not at my post, which meant I was not prepared for the boss arriving. The same thing can be true in our spiritual life. We are to live our lives so that when Christ returns, we will be unashamed before him. And that's 1 John 2.28. In Matthew 25, Jesus used a parable to show us how to be prepared. Matthew 25, 1 through 5. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. The parable of the ten virgins is one of several parables Jesus used to describe what the kingdom of heaven will be like. The kingdom of heaven is the state of things under the reign of God. It is God's current reign over the lives of redeemed people that will, be, will become fully realized in his ultimate reign over all the earth. The culture the background of this parable concerned Jewish wedding customs of the first century. Before a couple was married and they went through a period of betrothal, they were not fully married yet, but they were viewed as husband and wife. After about a year of a couple binding betrothal, the groom went to the bride's home to bring her to his home for a seven day feast. The groom did not do this alone. He was accompanied by a wedding party and escort, escorted the couple to the bridegroom's home. In Jesus' parable, the wedding party includes 10 virgins. The virgins are young women and marriageable age. Here, the word virgin is used not so much as highlight their virginity uh, or lack of sexual experience, but to highlight their relationship to the bride. These were the bridesmaids. It was a great honor not only to be invited to the wedding, but also to be part of the wedding party. 
A central part of Jesus' parable involves lamps. Part of the bridesmaid's responsibility was to light the path for the processional. In that day, small clay, uh, clay lamps were used at homes, but this story involved an outdoor procession with clay uh, uh, lamps, would not, uh, would not be useful. The lamps in view here likely were torches. They consist of a long pole with olive oil drenched rags at the top. To keep them lit, one needed a good supply of oil. Since the wedding was typical at evening ceremony, evening ceremony, people would know that you need to bring extra oil for your lamp. The bridesmaid and Jesus' parable were divided into two groups. In which group there were, uh, they were in dependence on their level of preparation. The level of their preparation classed them as either wise or foolish. The word rendered foolish means inattentive, thick-headed, and unthinkable, uh, unthinking. The word was frequently used in the book of Proverbs to describe many ungodly traits. The foolish virgins truly seemed to want to go to the wedding celebration. However, they did not respect the groom enough to think about the necessary preparation involved. On the other hand, the wise virgins showed what a life of faith should look like. They had the opposite mindset of foolish virgins in that they got ahead with clarity. People who have true faith in Christ show respect to Jesus by living lives of faithful preparation. Amen. Jesus told this parable in the context of his teaching about his second coming. So we can see that the bridegroom represents Christ. The wise virgin reflects true believers. The foolish virgin reflects those who may profess to believe in Jesus, but they have not prepared for the end of life by seeking a real relationship with Christ. All, uh, all are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19.9. But only those who accept the invitation through faith and trust in Christ will be able to attend. The twist in Jesus' parable came when the bridegroom tarried. They may refer to a stretch of history between Christ's first coming and his return. Christ wanted his followers to wait patiently for his return, but also be prepared for the unexpected. You likely know people who squandered their time and procrastinated on important matters. This was the plight of the foolish virgins. They should have had extra oil so that no matter how long it took for the groom to come out, their lamps would not go out. To delay the bridegroom led to the bridesmaid falling asleep. We should not read the fact that they all slumbered and slept with a negative con connotation. Jesus included no condemnation of their sleeping. After all, it was nighttime. In fact, the wise virgin could rest because they were fully prepared. It's the foolish virgins who should not have slept until they were fully prepared with full uh, flasks of oil. How would you describe a person who prepared for Christ's return? Well, he's preparing, you know, I mean, he's uh, doing God's will. He's uh, having a relationship with him uh, day by day, you know. Uh, he's prepared um, prayer, reading scripture, uh, obeying his commands, uh, and just living, living uh, the spiritual life. You know, he, he um, he's not perfect, but he's he's prepared. You know, and he's he's waiting for the, the Lord to, uh, return, and uh, he has uh, eternal view in mind too. You know, that's that's important. You know, uh, always keep that eternal uh, view, eternity. Where you're going to spend eternity, you know, and uh, yeah, Christ in your heart and. Uh, 
you're going to spend it with him. Okay. So Matthew 25, 6 to 9. And at midnight uh, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, be ye out to meet him. They all then all the, those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, least there be not enough for us and you, but ye uh go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourself. At midnight, most people are deep in sleep. Since the bridegroom came at such a late, unexpected hour and reinforced the principle that Christ's return will be a surprise, all ten bridesmaids were called out to meet the groom. It was during this time that the foolish virgins realized they had not prepared adequately for this moment. Trimming the lamp involves cutting the charred ends of the rags and the ends of the left rags need to be trimmed when they dry out. After they trim their lamps, they had to have more oil to keep them lit. Then the lamps had to be replenished by saturating the rags about every 15 minutes. The story is unfortunately unfortunate because the foolish virgins knew that they had not extra oil. No spectacular uh, uh, reasons are were given for their negligence, but their negligence in this matter was foolish. No, they had run out of time. It was too late to prepare. Nevertheless, the foolish virgin tried unsuccessfully to light their torch. The dry rag cloth would merely smoke as soon as it was lit. You can sense the panic setting in as the foolish bridesmaid begin to beg the wise virgin. Give us a, of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Unfortunately, the wise virgin had brought enough oil for their own lamp, but they had no oil to spare or share. Being prepared to meet Christ when he returns is an individual matter. That preparation cannot be transferred or shared. Amen? That's key. Parents do their best to prepare their kids for adulthood. They help them, provide for them, teach them, and encourage them but they cannot do their living for them. We cannot make choices for them. In the same way, we cannot depend on other people to make us right with God. Since salvation is a direct gift from God, the same person cannot operate as a savior to another person. Uh, recipients of grace that do not possess the ability to impart it to someone else no matter how much the compassion they can muster up. Each person must prepare himself for the coming king. Amen. Lack of spiritual preparation has eternal consequence. People tend to put preparation for other things above their spiritual life. Many prepare well for their career, their finance, and their relationships. Yet they ignore the importance of spiritual preparation. In that individual response to the call of Christ, that will determine his or her eternal future. No one has a second chance after Christ comes back or one dies. The time is now. What causes some people to be prepared? Uh, not or what? Are, what caused some people not to prepare for Christ's return? And like I said above, was the career, finance, they put everything else before their spiritual needs. And their, their, uh, so, uh, you know, they'll be of the world, but uh, we're going through the world. We're not of the world, but uh, in other words, walk in the spirit, not the flesh. You know, Matthew 25, 10 to 13. And while they were, uh, while they went to buy the bridegroom came, and there they were ready when it, uh, it was him to the marriage and the door was shut. 
afterward came also another verse saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. Everyone liked a happy ending to a story. Unfortunately, this parable had a sad ending. When the foolish bridemaids were left to go by more oil, the bridegroom came, and the groom would not think of pausing for uh, his wedding procession. To wait on them, he and they that were ready went with him to the marriage, without the foolish bridesmaid, and shut the door. A closed door that kept out the first century virgins of wedding crash. The virgins were not, uh, the virgins were most likely friends of the family who had been honored by the opportunity to serve in the wedding party. The problem was that the five foolish virgins did not return that honor. They had been invited to play a special role in their festivities but they choose not to do what was necessary to fulfill the role. This was more than just a flat pause. It was an effort and insult to bridegroom. The shut door pictures unbelievers being shut out of the kingdom of God. Many people assume that if you are not a horrible person, you, uh, you go to heaven when you die. Their assumption is that uh, just about everybody will get into heaven. But the Bible is clear. Those who do not know Christ will be shut out of God's kingdom forever. The foolish bridemaids have gone to get the lamp oil and they should have done nearly. But they were, they were, but they were ready to enter the wedding banquet. They found the door was shut. They realized they had aired, and they begged for entrance. This is a reminiscence of words that Apostle John spoke at the beginning of the book of Revelation. Behold, he comes with cloud, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierce him, and all kindred and all earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. Revelation 1.7. As the foolish virgin begged for entrance, they called out, Lord, Lord. This was a forced attempt to show intimacy that did not exist. Sometimes we use words to imply the depth of a relation that is not actually there. Christ made a similar point, similar point in his Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven, Matthew 7, 21. The foolish virgins were firmly and emphatically denied entrance. The master began his answers to the unprepared virgin by saying, Verily I say unto you, whenever Christ used this phrase, it means he's about to say something that was not up for negotiation. Uh, what was non negotiable here was the reality of the group's relationship with those five foolish virgins. I know you not. Salvation is the uh, ultimate personal relationship with God. Knowing Christ is not merely knowing data and information about God. While learning about Christ is important, our salvation is ultimately about personally knowing God. Entering into a relationship, uh, this is initiated by, Christ, initiated by Christ and received by us through faith and trust in Him. Yeah. The Christian life then is a lifelong journey and grow, growing closer to one we know through faith. What are the consequences of putting off preparation for Christ's return? Uh, this is. Uh, Christ would say, I know you're not. You know? Um, so um, be prepared and have a personal relationship with him. Find him into your heart. Uh, you know, be obedient to his words. You know, 
uh, he wants the best for you, he loves you, and he, he died for us so we could have a way to to your life, the book of life, you know. So, um, you know, you want to say, I, I don't know you, you know, you be the saddest thing to ever hear. Um, to make things right with God, it will be too little, too late. And as it appointed unto men once to die, but after that is the judgment, Hebrews 9 47. Jesus summed up this parable with a closing exhortation that he has said earlier in Matthew 24, 36, and 42. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. This is imperative, something we must do. We are to stay continuously awake constantly keeping watch. Let's walk with him, fully prepared and watching for the return of the one who uh, loves us. By being prepared and ready for his coming, we demonstrate our respect, love, and trust for our master. Amen. And then what can we do as group of, to increase our sense of urgency as we await for Christ? And then create a personal top 10 list and remembering the following actions in order to the priority, according to a personal plan for your, uh, uh, being prepared for Jesus Christ. And that study the scripture, treat other personal uh, people justly, live uh, ethically, worship uh, corporately, pray fervently. be sure of salvation, witness of Christ, serve Christ by serving people. Support the church financially and be on a mission for Jesus. And we can do that a week. Live it out. We are to grow in Christ as we wait for his return. Choose one of the following applications. Check your salvation. Think about your salvation experience. Do you have assurance that you know God personally? What are you trusting in for your salvation? Prayerfully read 2 Corinthians 13:5. As you consider if you truly have a relationship with Christ. Do be on guard, discipline your mind uh, to accept that God knows your future and that his knowledge of that is sufficient. Listen to no one who will lead you astray. Amen. Strengthen your faith, target an area of your of your own spiritual life that needs more attention. Maybe it's a in prayer life, possibly it's a fear of sharing the gospel, whatever it may be for you. Prepare to grow in that area in the days ahead. By praying specifically for a breakthrough, ask God to teach you how to say no to sin and yes to him. Amen. Then we read uh, a place called heaven. Uh, before my grandbabies learned to talk, she learned of some uh, signs. Clara often used the sign for more when she wanted additional milk. I would scoop her up in my arms and take her outside to see the ladybugs and flowers. No matter how long we stayed, when we came back inside, Clara always gave the signal for more. Some things inside the human heart yearns for more. God provides more than the earth can offer in heaven. <coughs> God provides more than this earth can provide, can offer in heaven. God did not tell us everything about heaven, but he has told us plenty, consider what we, uh, what we can know. Heaven is a little, little, literal place, since some people would question the reality of heaven. God let John record the measurements of the wall of heaven. See Revelation 12, 15, and 16. The walls ran over 14 miles long, wide and high. The ground level along would be close to 2 million square miles. Clearly, heaven has plenty of room for all who receive Jesus. <coughs> Heaven is a prepared place. Shortly before Jesus died, he said, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself 
so that where I am, you may be also. That's John 14, 2 and 3. Matthew 25, 34 says, God prepares heaven on the foundation of the world. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. Amen. Heaven is a place of unhappy reunion. Heaven is a place of happy reunion with loved ones. Whom do you look forward to seeing in heaven? I look forward to talking with my grandparents uh, in heaven. I miss my mother and father and look forward to being with them again. How do we know we will see our loved ones uh, who have died in the Lord? The Lord in Luke 16, 19 and 31, Jesus indicates recognition in heaven also. Paul anticipates being with the Thessalonians in heaven and has never occurred to him that he wouldn't know them. In fact, if we would know our loved ones, the comfort of our afterlife reunion time in Thessalonians 4, 14, 18 would be no comfort at all. all right? Heaven is a place where God lives. Think how wonderful it feels when you are all in a worship service where his presence seems so close. Revelation 21 describes our future home with God. God dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them. Verse 3. Heaven is a place of joy. Imagine the joy of complete forgiveness and heaven. Everyone be whole and healthy, joyful, uh, and peaceful. As I type these words in my mind, I am singing hallelujah. What a Savior today. I yearn for more. God has provided more in heaven. Amen. I always think of the song. Uh, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Hallelujah. Amen. That'd be quite a day. And see your loved ones. So be prepared. This is a good lesson. Um, you know, all these were good lessons here. According to Jesus. And uh, so next week we'll start on a... Uh, a new lesson thing, and it'll be uh, never alone the Holy Spirit in, in our lives. And uh, session one will be convicted by the Spirit. Uh, uh, it'll be, uh, so if you want to look, that would be uh, John 15, 26, and 27, and 16, 7 through 15. That'll be the next week lessons. And the point is the Holy Spirit convicts of sin and points to the truth of salvation. So they should be good lessons. So we look forward for you next week. And uh, we pray you have a blessed week. That's probably the word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this lesson, Lord, that the teachers to be prepared uh, to receive uh, that you're coming again before us, Lord, that we be prepared, Lord. By the prayer, Lord, we stay in your word, have a personal relationship with you day by day, Lord, and I look forward to you coming and be prepared, Lord. Uh, walk in the spirit and not uh, in the flesh, Lord. Uh, be more uh, walking in the spirit and, and not the flesh, Lord. So these things of word sidetrack us, but Lord, the more we in your word and the personal relationship you guided you out day and night. Uh, Lord, so we seek you first, the kingdom of God, and your righteousness, Lord. And you say you let out all these things to us, Lord. So we just pray, Lord, that you answer, you. Lord, our prayers, Lord, as according to your will, Lord. We pray for all the prayer requests we'll mention, Lord, that you touch each one in a special way, Lord, and let them know that you are working on their behalf, Lord, and that uh, you will be done in their lives. And uh, the best, we want the best for us. We love you, Lord, and we give you the praise, honor, and glory always. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, have a blessed week and keep in the word. Amen.